So thank you so much for joining us. My name is Nicole Bewillier Fenton. I have the good fortune of working in UVM's continuing and distance education department. I am um, supported by an incredible team, uh, Foster Nye and Eric Melton and Kelly Baldwin as well, who are helping out um, to bring this uh, webinar live to you today. I would like to introduce our incredible panelists who are taking time out of what we all know is an incredibly busy and challenging time. So I have Tom Delaney who is with us today. Tom is an assistant professor in our Department of Pediatrics and also an instructor in our fully online Master of Public Health program. Tom, thank you so much for joining us today. And also we have Annie Valentine. Annie joins us with, from UVM's Health and Center for Health and Well-Being on UVM campus. She's incredibly busy at this time trying to support undergrad and graduate students. She's an education and training manager in the Center for Health and Well-Being. Annie, thank you so much for being with us. And also joining us today is Dr. Andy Rosenfeld, a child psychiatrist at the Vermont Center for Children and Youth and Families, and also an assistant professor. Dr. Rosenfeld, thank you for being with us today. Thanks for inviting me, Nicole. And also, Dr. David Tomasi joins us, a clinical psychologist and psychotherapist at the University of Vermont Medical Center, a lecturer in many different programs here at the University of Vermont, and one in particular that we work on at the Continuing and Distance Education is the Integrated Health Program. So very happy to have you with us as well, Dr. Tomasi. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we have a lot to talk about today. This is an incredibly um, personal and um, thought-provoking topic for parents as we all are trying to understand how we can support our children with their own mental health in addition to our mental health during the coronavirus pandemic and the challenges that we all have been facing. So we're going to hear from um, Tom Delaney about children's mental health pre-COVID-19. What was the landscape of children's mental health before the coronavirus pandemic? And then he'll talk about possible impacts of disease and disaster on mental health. And then we'll hear from Dr. Tomasi, looking at the mind-body problem during COVID-19, what is the neuroscience happening in our children, in their brains, and their bodies as well. And then we'll move over into discussion about pandemic parenting. That's really what we're trying to do right now. And Dr. Rosenfeld will walk us through some strategies and coping methods for parents of children and young adults. Um, and also making space for loss and the stages of grief, which we are going through. Um, and our children are as well. And then how can we make space for some health maintenance also? And then Annie Valentine will walk us through undergrad and graduate student resources and who they are, what are they dealing with, what can we do to help, what do they need as well. And as I mentioned earlier, we have several slides that are um, numerous resources for our parents and for our students um, that many of our panelists have pulled together and uh, we're happy to share those with you today. Um, and we also have a really interesting and exciting opportunity for folks who are participating in the webinar today is a digital badge. You can earn a digital badge for your participation and I'll explain a little bit more about that and the opportunity to claim that badge for your participation in this learning experience today. So I'd like to, um, just a housekeeping note as well, I've mentioned, um, but for po folks that maybe have just joined us, um, I'm going to keep my eye on that chat box to the best of my ability. And I also have our panelists who are willing to jump in and answer questions. So if you do have questions, please put them in the chat box. I will do my best to keep an eye on them. And if by chance we don't get to your question, we'll put up email address and we'll try to follow up with, um, you can follow up with those questions afterwards. So I'd like to toss over to Tom Delaney with our Master of Public Health program. Thank you so much, Tom. Can you walk us through some of the information and, and give us a little background, maybe the landscape of where mental health sat before the coronavirus with our um, young, our children and our young adults? Thank you, Nicole. I'm just going to take a few minutes to go over some recent trends in young people's mental health. And, you know, we could talk for hours about that, about what the different trends are. And I'm really going to focus on two of the ones that um, people tend to have more questions about, which are depression and suicidality. And suicidality includes suicidal thinking, so suicidal acts, and less frequently actual suicide. Um, and first, um, we're going to go through a couple of graphs, um, stick with it, even though they're graphs, and um, hopefully you don't have graph PTSD from earlier presentations like this. 
Um, in terms of background on depression, anxiety, and suicide, um, I just wanted to make sure we're, we're generally having a common understanding. Um, most people with depression and anxiety, even serious uh, depression and anxiety, will not go on to die by suicide. And that's a misconception that some, some people have sometimes. And suicide deaths are actually relatively rare in young people. So in Vermont and in most of the US, um, the age groups that tend to die by suicide more often are actually middle-aged and older, and they tend to be male. Um, however, suicide attempts, attempts are high um, in younger people, and suicide-related thinking and um, self-harming, whether it's with a suicidal intent or not with suicidal intent, are actually pretty common in young people. Um, and I'll, I'll defer to my clinical colleagues for how best to um, address issues like this as they come up, but I do want to drive home the fact that, um, you know, any expression of suicidal thinking and self-harming behavior um, should be taken really seriously. Um, that seems really important. The data that I'm going to show you are really from two sources here in Vermont and nationally. The first is a youth risk behavior survey, which is done every other year, and most Vermont middle schools and high schools participate in that. Uh, and then for a little bit older um, young people, so ages 18 to 24, we use data from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, or, or BRFSS. These are both self-report, um, but over time we found them to be pretty reliable um, and really our best available way of gauging trends in mental health. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, so this is the first of two graphs. This is from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. And if you look at the yellow line at the bottom, um, these are all percentages. They're a percent of all people, um, high school age young people who completed the YRBS survey over four administrations of the survey going back to 2013. So if you look at the yellow line, um, that's probably our most concerning line, and that's at young people who actually report having made a suicide attempt in the past 12 months. And you can see that number is um, relatively low. I mean, in one sense, it's really high. But compared to the other um, lines, it's relatively low. There is a bit of a concerning uptick from 2017 to 2019, where the number of young people who self-report a suicide attempt seems to have increased. The line above that is um, young people who made a suicide plan, which also shows a slight increase in the past two years. The line above that, the red line, is purposely hurt self without wanting to die, so that's non-suicidal self-injury. That also shows an increase from 2017 to 2019. And our largest increase is the top line, the blue line, which is young people who report feeling sad or hopeless for two or, two or more weeks in the past 12 months. And that's, um, that's a marker and a symptom for major depressive disorder. So these are, these are all concerning um, trends. This slide, we don't have the, um, the suicidal intention trend data from the BRFSS, but this is depression trend data from the BRFSS from 2013 through 2018. And the, um, the top blue line is 18 to 24 year olds in Vermont. So if you look at 2017 and 2018, there's about 30% of the young, young adult age, 18 to 24, um, met criteria for major depressive disorder. Um, and then the red line under that is the remainder of Vermont adults, so 25 and older. And then below that is the US rates. And one thing to note is that it's actually really common in a lot of states, we see this pattern where um, the depression rates in the 18 to 24 year olds are actually substantially higher than they are um, for the remainder of the adult population. Um, and again, we have this disturbing trend though, right? So starting in about 2016, we see that the young adults are showing higher rates of depression um, relative to the other age ranges and relative to the US. We can go ahead to the next slide. So we don't have a great research base for talking about um, what are the impacts of events like the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, I was only able to find one paper um, in you know, the past 100 years of science that examined the impacts of the influenza on mental influenza ep epidemic 1918 to 20 on mental health. And that was really focused on adult mental health, not so much young people. 
Um, but there is literature that's coming from events like um, Recover from Hurricanes. There's literature from the 20, uh, 2009, 2010 economic downturn, um, various other types of disasters. And um, what you see is that there are, there are um, immediate impacts and then there are longer and medium and longer term impacts that are seen in terms of populations, mental health. And a really interesting um, and concerning thing is that there can often be a lag time. So um, something that's been in the media in the last couple of weeks is that there can be a rally around the flag effect where initially um, in the immediate weeks following um, the start of a disaster or in our case, a pandemic, um, people might really pull together and be very supportive of each other. And, and there might actually be some protective um, factors associated with that. However, what you see is over time, there might be sort of a rebound effect where people um, actually are, are um, showing more symptoms than they may have prior to the event. And there's, there are hints um, that there are increasing concerning behaviors in the US in recent weeks. So um, a report just came out showing that calls to crisis lines for like suicide, domestic violence, things like that have increased in recent weeks. Um, and there are, there's other anecdotal evidence for increases in domestic violence. There, I just saw this morning, I saw a report, um, a survey showing that there appears to be greater alcohol consumption in recent weeks. And there's an older literature showing that in the wake of disasters like 9-11, um, a lot of people do turn to alcohol use, including excessive alcohol use as a coping mechanism. Um, and then um, interestingly, um, highly increased firearm sales in the US. And that's of concern to us who are engaged with suicide prevention because we know that having a firearm in the home is actually um, significantly increases your risk of someone in your, your family or in your home dying of suicide. And we can go to the next slide. So what are we thinking in terms of things to look out for and, and the, the negative impacts? Well. We believe that there's general increases in social isolation and loneliness. Um, and we're also concerned that people may not be able to access their normal supports. And that could be as simple as, you know, going for a walk with friends. Maybe you're not doing that anymore. Maybe it's not living with all the people that you used to live with because they are, they're now living with someone else. It could be um, parents uh, split parenting situations where a child is not seeing the other parent regularly anymore. Um, people not having access, um, live access to their faith supports, um, AA meetings, NA meetings, and a lot of these things have gone virtual, but people may not be able to access them the same way. Um, and then a huge thing I think that we've seen in the media um, is separation from other people who are hospitalized, even to the point when they're dying. So not being, not being able to say goodbye in ways that we typically would, would want to be able to say goodbye. Um, and just loss of normal routines and normal rituals. And then um, we saw this, uh, especially going back in the past two weeks, uh, three weeks, we saw that um, people are beginning to lose their jobs in larger numbers. And the literature supports that um, families and individuals, including young people, um, can be really impacted by financial stresses, such as mass loss of jobs. So the last thing I just want to point out before we transition is that um, we should really be thinking too about people who have existing vulnerabilities. So young people who may already be struggling with depression, anxiety, young people who have a history of self-harming or suicidality. Um, it's really important probably to be checking in with them and helping them connect to services. And yeah, I just wanted to end with that, that plug. Great. Thank you so much, Tom, for sharing that background and a look at where um, there are challenges for our young people as well. And we're going to hear a lot more about solutions and, and possible resources um, and tips to help because I know as a parent, um, we're always looking for something that we can do to hopefully help with that situation with our children. So I'd like to toss over to Dr. David Tomasi to walk us through um, what's happening in the bodies of our adolescents um, that may also be contributing to some of these um, stresses and anxieties that our children may be feeling as well. Dr. Tomasi? Yep, now we can hear you. There we are. Thank you. 
So in these few slides, I would like to uh, tackle two main areas. One has to do with uh, basic neurology and neuroscience, and the other one more with uh, theory and philosophy. Now, doing this within a few minutes, it's really a difficult task, but I want to make sure to focus on uh, the aspects that are more relevant um, to uh, families struggling uh, during this pandemic. Um, and in this context, I also want to um, spend just a few seconds um, expressing uh, the level of gratitude that I have for um, all the families. And um, I'm a father myself, and so I would not even be able to be here were it not for uh, my wife, uh, who is actually taking care of the children. So one of the things just to, to start in general is to, um, for all of us, um, dealing with the situation, uh, finding a place in which we can express gratitude uh, to our loved ones, uh, because we are all in this together. Um, that said, I would like to uh, move on to the first slide. Thank you. Um, the first thing I would like to mention is um, attempting to normalize the process we are uh, faced with. Um, um, as a parent, we want to make sure uh, to do our best for our children. And we want to make sure to provide appropriate support in a time in which we are faced with things that we might not fully understand ourselves, not so much from the biological standpoint, but in terms of our emotional response to stress and anxiety. And so I would like to uh, very briefly uh, discuss what the most important things are in a child and adolescent's brain in this context. And I'd like to focus on five main areas that are listed in this slide. So the campus, the amygdala, the AIC, and the ACC, um, as well as prefrontal cortex. Um, without uh, spending too much time on each of these areas, um, perhaps uh, we could um, discuss what are the most relevant situations that we can target from the perspective of psychology. Now, this, in this slide, you can see some basic psychological interventions that we use with both um, uh, children and adolescent population and adult population. Um, I only listed five, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectic behavioral therapy, psychodynamic therapy, humanistic and voice psychology, and then I would almost say everything else, including spiritual and religion and tradition. Now, um, if you don't mind, yes, I'd like to focus on um, the slide on the neurofunctional discussion. So one of the things to keep in mind is that we are faced with a twilight zone in the context of adolescent behavior. Um, we are faced with a lot of change that occur at a very uh, rapid pace, and some theorists believe that adolescence is really the last stage in the childhood development, some believe that it's the very first stage of a free adult situation. One of the things to keep in mind as a parent is that we should do our best to uh, match our expectations from a cognitive standpoint and an emotional standpoint to the level of skill that adolescents can achieve. So for instance, um, what would be the best strategy not to lose our patients when we are faced with difficulty? Well, one of the things is to understand that the level of interpretation that the adolescent brain has might not fully match an adult ones. And this can turn into um, excessive uh, or even inappropriate display of strong emotions, inability to focus, inability to follow rules, as well as some challenges. Uh, this is especially true for uh, the previous stage of development, uh, difficulties in assessing um, what we could quantify as moral or ethical judgment. Classical example, in the previous stage of development, we cannot really uh, make the claim that a child who is four years old, for instance, is purposely lying to us in the sense that the cognitive capacity may distinction between a false statement and a lie it's not fully there quite yet. Now granted, when we are faced with um, a lot of stress, it is hard to remind ourselves that our emotions should match the context and we always start from a place of um, nurturing sense of self. But it's very good to understand that certain things are neurologically limited in the context of the adolescent's brain. So, to start with this uh, brief overview, um, what, what can we do to at least understand what's going on in the lesson brain so that we'll be better equipped to uh, match uh, our response? 
Well, the first area that we see in this nice hippocampus, which is an area of the brain that is related to uh, a variety of things, so I would like to focus on um, emotional um, component as well as um, memory. And, and for instance, in the context of understanding the bigger picture, um, it is very challenging to envision a possible future in a situation in which we are forced uh, to stay at home and self-isolate. Now, this recommendation, which is a very appropriate recommendation from the epidemiological standpoint in terms of public health, would be considered a very inappropriate recommendation in the context of mental health in general. That's something that um, you know, we always advise individuals not to do, is to self-isolate, whatever the problem might be. So the situation we find ourselves in um, is, by definition, an unfortunate uh, series of uh, events that do not uh, foster an appropriate mind-body connection. So um, inside the, the hippocampus and the, the role the hippocampus plays in memory production and, and retrieval, the other areas are pretty much related to uh, the fight and flight response, stress response, we're talking about the amygdala special um, um, areas that have to do with both cognition and emotion, and that is true, especially for the uh, anterior singular cortex, um, as well as for the anterior insular cortex. And then for the prefrontal cortex, which is what we should really be focusing on, an area that it's not really fully developed until the very uh, last stage of adolescence, and granted it's developed a little uh, earlier for uh, biological female subjects than the male subjects. Now that, that part of the brain is responsible for a cascade of, of, of responses, especially cognitive and even more ethical judgment to uh, understand a situation and act appropriately. So in a situation like the, the one that an adolescent uh, is faced with, there might be a disconnect, a neurocognitive disconnect, as well as a cognitive disconnect between um, our ability to jump ahead and, and, and seek adventure and react uh, in a very uh, uh, fast rate, but at the same time having enough cognitive knowledge to have a certain level of veto power not to overemphasize from asthma. And this applies to our um, concept of self. The lessons tend to be, I would say, self-focused. I would not say self-centered necessarily. And by that, simply mean they have, uh, they spend a, a lot of time being worried about their physical appearance, the way they interact with peers. Um, and so what appears sometimes to us as um, either a reckless behavior or inappropriate display of emotion or simply unpreparedness to, to face life circumstances, it also has to do with the neurological situation they find themselves in. And and this is, you know, based on a variety of events, uh, the, the two which I'd like to focus mostly are related to myelination and pruning, which are both uh, connected to our ability uh, at the brain level to recreate um, syntax that, that, are, that are focused on new experiences, which in turn means that the more we can help our children navigate their emotions, either with words or with their body, in context of deep breathing exercises, for instance, spending time together, addressing uh, issues that might linger just below the surface, you know, over a meal, for instance, to be navigated with experiences with them, we actually demonstrate them the appropriate response for in terms of what you think, how to think about things, and also relate to the body. And this is really what I'd like to focus on the very last slide, which we call the broader perspective. And it's really impossible to, to uh, discuss the mind-body problem within a few minutes. But for the purpose of this pandemic, understand there are certain things that we can teach and we can guide our uh, children that should be based on thoughts and words. So the way we express, the way we label an issue, for instance, a lot of the the difficulties that adolescents are faced with are due to their inability to actually understand from a thought standpoint what is going on. So labeling the issue helps them navigate what appears to be an unknown response. Um, in, in, in previous stage of development, we could build up a temper tantrum, for instance, where a child feels almost cognitively possessed by the situation, not really fully understanding what is going on at the level of the somatoforming situation, their body, and Definitely not thinking clearly. 
in the case of the adolescent, we might have both. So on one side, addressing that by talking in a calm and nurturing way to our children. On the other side, also using their bodies as you know a way to foster emotional intelligence and body awareness. So the model I suggest here, it's, it's not something that I came up with. It's part of the, uh, you know, the longest tradition within philosophy and critical neuroscience. Um, I would just want to focus on this triple S model, which I call self soul spirit, um, just for clarity. Now, whenever we talk about uh, things that are at the core between you know, solid evidence based science and more theoretical speculation, you know, the individual should really change and adapt those terms to their own experience. But one of the things that uh, I notice, at least in my conversations with my patients, is a sense of uh, unexpected, gloomy, dark future that we're faced with. And so there, there is a normalization of the process and this overall tension that has to do with not quite knowing the end we want to over simplify it too. So an adolescent that uh, by definition, by neurological and fine definition is more prone to view things in black and white and, and possibly engage in what we call cognitive distortions in psychology might be better guided if we are actually able to utilize some of those words to uh, kind of shed some light on the experience. So, uh, so in, in, in this sense, I, I, I attempted to reframe the stress response, the anxiety we face, the fear, uncertainty, with an existential experience. And, and, and I suggested these this three things, an individual experience, which is subjectively understood, transcendental experience, which can be internally felt, and metaphysical experience, which can be divinely inspired. Now, without sounding too, uh, too you know, theologically focused here, but the idea that I had is, in a term of uncertainty, focusing on fostering multiple levels of understanding what parents uh, should at least think about. So creating a sense of community and closeness to their children and, and, and value their own individual response to, to the fear and anxiety. In that sense, it's subjectively understood. Each experience is unique. And to match their emotion by allowing their body to react appropriately, so not attempting not to repress the way they feel, whether they express their emotion by virtue of, of uh, raising their voice or, or crying, meaning where they add and then bring them to a place of more conscious awareness and kind of relaxed response. And finally, the divine inspire, of course, this one sounds very, very religious, but the, it is, it's based upon this lack of certainty, which can be you know, associate with, with the bargaining phase. I'm sure Dr. Uh, Rosenthal will have uh, more to say about, about the grief response, but part of this bargaining phase we might, uh, we might have to deal with is in the absence of certain responses, figuring out a way to appropriately reframe the question. So why this, why me, why now, and even more important, what does this pandemic, this experience mean to me? To me? Thank you, Dr. Tomasi. Um, really appreciate that uh, as well. Um, and I know, Dr. Feldman, um, Rosenfeld, you're going to talk a little bit too about, um, you know, maybe thinking of ways to bring gratitude um, into our lives more often. Um, you shared with me when we talked a week ago just the practice that you've been doing on your way home, just thinking of all the things that you got done and things that went right. Versus as parents and working parents, we often think about the things we didn't get done. Um, and so I really appreciated you sharing that with me. So, um, Dr. Uh, first of all, can you walk us through here, because um, we are trying to parent amongst a pandemic, and, and what does that mean, and, and what resources can we also um, provide parents to try to help them through this? Yeah, thanks for including me in this conversation. It's really beautiful to hear the epidemiology and the neuroscience behind some of this, and I'm glad to talk for a few minutes about some practical aspects of parenting. I think that there is no playbook for parenting in a pandemic, so the title's a little bit tongue-in-cheek. Um, and I think that most of uh, what we know has to be adapted for the current situation, so I wanted to start with a familiar adage of putting your oxygen mask on 
first before you can help the people around you? And what are the ways that we can do that now? I think it's really called for because when you and I were talking about this presentation, Nicole, we were just kind of marveling at the way all of our lives have been disrupted at every level and every facet and everything that's sort of held together, our families, our jobs, our knowledge of the world, everything that's scaffolded that has kind of been ripped out from underneath us in many instances in a way that's really unsettling. And how to cope with that while we're being asked to continue working or looking for work, supporting our families, schooling our kids, managing our households, and all the other things is, is kind of just overwhelming. And I think that the first point I put under the oxygen mask is awareness, acknowledging that sense of overwhelm, the roller coaster of emotions that go with that in ourselves is probably the first step to then being able to figure out how we can show up for our kids or our families or our kids who are looking up to us or looking to us for support. And on that note, I also wanted to invite everybody. Everybody is breathing now, hopefully. Uh, but I wanted to invite everybody to take a breath with awareness together now in the sense that taking the next breath, focusing on the breath and knowing that you're breathing. And noticing the difference between the breathing that we do every day, every hour, sleeping, waking, parenting, not parenting, yelling, calm, and what it might feel like to take a breath with awareness. And that's a skill that I think takes a lot of practice and is really worth trying to access now because there's not a simple parenting tip or strategy I can say will work in every situation or for every family or for every kid or even for one family or child all of the time. There's a lot of flexibility required, and I think the flexibility is born from awareness of what's happening inside of me, what am I feeling right now, and what's going on with my family, my kids, the people around me in the situation. And we don't often make space for that, so actually taking time, even if it's one breath, or one minute, or one walk, or one nap, or whatever the space is that one can make to build that awareness it's going to model and it's also going to feed back becoming aware of what your child's experience is or your children. And that, I think, is probably the key to a lot of pandemic parenting is tuning in to what's going on with your children. So getting myself in a place where I am open to listening and being an active participant in their experience will allow me to see what might be needed in that moment, whether it's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or a walk outside or some extra screen time with their friends whatever it might be. And the second underlying principle I uh, would highlight is the individuality of it all. Um, I think Tom and um, <clears throat> David, to some extent, both highlighted developmental changes in the sequence and how this isn't going to be the same for a three-year-old or a 13-year-old or 23-year-old. And within that span, every 13-year-old is not like every other 13-year-old. So remembering that you're an expert on your kids and your family and taking the millions of websites and recommendations that are being floated around and picking the ones that are useful to you reminds me of uh, with my wife and I raising our own kids and there's so many parenting manuals and guides and we decided we're just going to pick one. It may not be the best one, but there's a good enough one for us and we're going to stick with that so that we feel some comfort and this is our path and, and we're going to stick with something that's familiar, some guidance. So. Uh, figuring out what works for your individual family without being overwhelmed always of am I doing the perfect thing all the time, good enough is good enough. And the last point I try to underscore is recalling our values, which probably haven't shifted too much because of the pandemic. And values is not just the things that we value, but it's also the situations and the people that help us to feel valued, the interactions where we feel as if we matter. And some of those will be with our kids, some of those will be with our friends or with our colleagues. But part of that uh, ripping the rug out from under our quote unquote normal lives is that the places where we usually find a sense of purpose may no longer be there, whether that's employment or whether that's a part of our parenting that we cherish or whether it's a relationship with somebody who we may have lost to death, we may have lost to distance. Uh, there have been so many. Uh, losses during this time and so much uncertainty. 
So coming back to the situations that bring us a sense of meaning and what matters, I think is important no matter what we're doing. On the next slide, I've tried to highlight loss itself because it's so ubiquitous right now. And um, there's the maybe more obvious loss of those of us who are grieving or dying or have lost loved ones. And then there's a lot of hidden losses about our routines, um, not so hidden losses of jobs and financial stability, losses of connections and mental health supports. And I think that the, this theory of the five stages of grief or uh, grief and grieving or um, death and dying, there are different books written about it by um, Elizabeth Kubler Ross, who created it, and David Kessler, who's at it a lot. I am reminding myself about these stages because I think they're applicable to a lot of what we're experiencing. I've listed them here denial, anger, bargaining, depression acceptance, and potentially meaning-making. And I put wash, rinse, repeat because this is not a linear process. David Kessler, one of the authors on this topic, describes it as a description of the stages, not a prescription. This isn't the surefire pathway to get through the pandemic or death or loss, but it's a description of common human experiences when faced with uh, tremendous losses and uncertainty. And each of us may be at different stages of this at different times and getting out of sync if somebody is at acceptance and somebody else is at denial, that's a hard fit. We also may cycle through stages of it over the course of a day or a week. Uh, I've been thinking in my own family sometimes it's not a question of, you know, uh, is there going to be a meltdown today or this week? It's whose turn is it today to have a meltdown? Uh, how many of us? And so, um, Recognizing that, I think, is, is important because if it goes unnamed, then we can't address it and we can't support each other and it just kind of grows in its power to make us feel small or ashamed or unsupported. Um, and I put on here relation to kids, some of the unseen losses that are you know, driving the kids to practice. Those are some of my best conversations with my kids or teenagers, you know, before and after class talking to their friends and catching up or with a teacher or a coach or important mentor. So to recognize that all those things can't be replaced or recreated, but to acknowledge the loss and think about how those supports might be derived from other sources. Absolutely, things that we uh, probably are aware of, but maybe haven't had a conversation with our children that recognizing that they're feeling that too. Mm -hmm. Right, and holding some space for recognizing the stages. And then for me, it's a lot easier to be like, ah, they're in bargaining. They're trying to think, well, maybe I can go outside and play with my friends if, uh, you know, if we keep three feet apart, that's probably safer if I wear a mask or, you know, some of that is just dealing with what are the health ramifications of COVID-19 and some of it is how can I get back to some sense of normalcy or reclaim some of the things that I might have lost. Uh, this uh, next idea about negativity bias is also to recognize that we have this built-in mechanism for seeing the negative for being critical, if not hypercritical, for seeing the flaws. It comes from a good place that this is a survival mechanism. This is how we um, kept the tribe alive, kept ourselves alive by being on alert for dangers, for threats, for negative things in the environment, for things that wouldn't work. So because it's built in, it's helpful to not beat yourself up about having a negativity bias when the world has become appreciably more dangerous. Now we're getting messages from reliable sources that say, try not to go outside, try not to be close to people. Um, and those are, those are sometimes unfounded fears, and right now they're more founded than usual. And so uh, having that negative part of our brains, the worry part, uh, in the parts of the brain that David mentioned in terms of our, our sort of um, reptilian or more ancient brain survival modes in hyperdrive right now is just a normal response to times with uh, very abnormal circumstances and the emotions listed here, scared, angry, sad, confused, overwhelmed, those are normal responses. So the first thing about what can I do is don't just do something, stand there. Kind of turning the familiar phrase on its head to circle back to awareness and bring your awareness to what is this experience. How is it affecting us? How is it affecting our children, our parenting, and our connection? And that there isn't always something to do. Some of the losses we've had can't be 
reclaimed or reinvented, and we may have to find new ways to connect or new ways out of this or new ways to tolerate these unusual levels of distress. Next, it requires a lot of flexibility and recognizing that it's not about getting through stage one of denial and then I'm done with it. It's going to cycle back. The emotions are going to be up and down. And that's why awareness is needed almost all the time because there's, there's not one recipe. It's not a linear course. Um, and neither will it be for our kids who are going to shuffle through their understanding based on their developmental stage, their cognitive capacity to make sense of it. So bring some awareness to listening what's going on in ourselves and others. And finally, if all else fails, you can just focus on the negative. So this technique from comes out of Stoic philosophy that I find helpful to share is called negative visualization. And it's essentially a gratitude practice flipped upside down where instead of saying, for what am I grateful? I take a little time to imagine some of the important things as if they were losses. What if I didn't have this uh, forum to speak to my colleagues? What if I didn't have Zoom so I could keep seeing the patients and families that I work with? What if I didn't have my wife at home taking care of the kids so I could be doing this job? What if I didn't have this job? So on and so forth. Not dwelling on the loss itself, but allowing some feeling of appreciation that when I go home and see my wife and kids, Thank goodness that they're still there, that I have them. When I have the opportunity to speak with you all and hear and learn with you, that I'm very grateful for that experience. So negative visualization can be a nice counterpart to a gratitude practice of focusing on the positive things. And finally and fundamentally, health promotion or health maintenance, the basics that without these, it's hard for any human to function well, getting a good night's sleep, having a consistent sleep routine, not buying into the myth that we can catch up on sleep, certainly not after a marathon pandemic like this. Is there going to be a chance to catch up on sleep for a few months or a few years? Making sure to fuel the body. I like to think about um, putting into our bodies what we want our bodies to be made out of. And so there's no particular pandemic diet, but just thinking about how what we eat and drink is affecting our well-being and our balance. Moving just turns out to be important for brain health and balance and social connection. So whatever way that is, that may be gardening, it may be cooking, stirring the pot together, it may be going for a walk, but all of those things count. And connecting, again, circling back to the people where we get a sense of uh, value, of being valued, of mattering. They matter to us, we matter to them, the people that believe in us. And then the bonuses here, um, which I would include finding a space for stillness or what some call mindfulness, doesn't have to be a formal meditation practice, uh, but finding some kind of peace of mind, however one does that. Reading is a great sort of retreat um, and practice and coming back to your own classics, what are the books from different stages of your life uh, that have seen you through some ups and downs and introduce you to ideas or characters that are helpful. And then lastly, music. Um, this is kind of movement for the mind, um, whether it's dancing or singing or playing music. Those are all ways that we connect to ourselves and connect to one another and allow us to also be centered in that awareness that I was mentioning uh, from the beginning. So I think uh, finding options amongst these and trying to tend to the basics even in time of crisis is quite important for ourselves and helping our kids with these routines. And thank you for giving us that visual representation in the beginning when you were talking about um, the oxygen mask. Because if we as parents can't find at least an opportunity to do some of these things that you list here, then we're going to be in more jeopardy to be able to support children as well. Speaking of children, um, we, we've been talking about um, kind of a wide range of ages of our children. There's no doubt that we need to um, be considering what's happening with our undergrad population and our graduate students here at UVM um, as they are scattered um, all over the United States back at their homes as well. So Annie Valentine joins us as well just to give us a glimpse of to the kinds of conversations that you're having with our undergrads and graduate students um, and the particular challenges that they're facing and some uh, opportunities to support them as well. Annie? 
Um, thank you. Uh, I hope I'm uh, loud enough and I'll do my best to, to be clear and succinct and just want to thank the presenters uh, that came before me in capturing um, some of the things that I am gathering from our students um, in these past few weeks, not trying to make assumptions as an educator around what our students need, but really listening to them and not, uh, getting a, a better understanding of what they are experiencing. Um, but I wanted to go over just a few of the vulnerable audiences that we um, uh, know are experiencing this pandemic um, in, some, in some different ways and that we're paying attention to. Um, so our BIPOC students, so Black, Indigenous, people of color, our international students who make up a small portion of students who are still on campus and might be experiencing um, some uh, targeted um, responses due to, to people's uh, perspective on this pandemic. Um, our seniors, uh, so students who are getting ready to graduate, and um, as we've talked about grief and loss, um, that people are experiencing that on many levels, but that you know, working really hard to get your degree and then not having that culminating experience with your peers um, can be really challenging. I'm sorry, there, I put that twice for the BIPOC, but um, also our LGBTQA um, population. I've been following the chat here and thinking about um, students returning home to spaces that might not feel safe, where they feel supported or where they have maybe come out or to their families um, uh, or are in the midst of going through uh, transitioning. And so what does that feel like and what does that mean for them? Students with learning disabilities and trying to maintain their academic performance and struggling with different platforms as we all are um, in, in different ways. And students with ongoing uh, mental health challenges and illness, as Tom mentioned, and um, I have a very weirdly colored purple shirt on today, but I am wearing this um, intentionally as Today is the first National Collegiate Recovery Day. Um, we are really trying to support our students who are in recovery from substance use disorders during this time, um, as Tom mentioned, increase in substances might happen for those who don't necessarily have a substance use disorder, um, but then those that might be working their recovery and having this be a really challenging time to find connection and to maintain that. And so I just really want to give a shout out and, and um, really acknowledge the journey that, that, that those students might be on. Um, and so again, this is not exhaustive, but these are some of the students that we are considering. Um, and then, you know, what, what are the experiences that are happening? And again, the presenters before me have highlighted some of these, um, but these are some of the, the things that I've been hearing directly from students, as well as other colleges um, in terms of their counseling centers and sitting in webinars to kind of get a collective understanding, um, you know, feeling disconnected, feeling isolated, um, that grief and loss for many different reasons. The overarching anxiety and fear and worry around when will this end, um, what will be the fallout, and then the financial burdens that come along um, potentially after it, whether it's because of our family members and their job loss or financial aid and how the, there's so much unknown. Um, and so really looking at that. Um, conflict at home. So maybe you have gone to college leaving conflict that had already been there, but then there's also the um, conflict that might be arising because of this new um, living experience. So, Either way, there might be some tension in thinking about what where privacy is and how do I um, find my independence in some of this um, this new new living when I have left um, home and been living on my own um, and making choices and decisions for myself. And now that ha is shifting. Um, again, that what next piece um, relationship problems, right? So I am in a relationship with someone that I. I don't see uh, or can't touch. I don't have that, that, that connection in the way that I once did. Um, again, thinking about issues of bias and racism and microaggressions that might happen through technology. Um, we are, I'll be sharing a slide in a, in a few moments around the different programming um, opportunities that we are providing that also leaves it open to lots of different ways that people can come into technology behind a screen and um, commit kind of or 
enact bias, racism, microaggression, xenophobia, things that we are trying to manage while trying to provide supportive places for our students. Um, managing that online learning, I think that's um, all across the board from faculty, staff, students trying to figure out how to do it, how to create a schedule for themselves, the technology challenges, and then the other life stressors that are just going on that are not related to COVID and, and the virus, right? So that there's other losses, there are other things that we are managing and then this just gets compounded. Um, and so these are just a very brief glimpse of what um, we are hearing our students saying they are experiencing. And then also having them share with us what, what would be helpful and what they're needing. Um, so I've been, again, reading some of the comments in the chats around what are the ways that we can support our students. And, and so, um, and also knowing that the ages of 18 to 24 is that vulnerable time when the onset of mental illness actually, you know, kind of is heightened. And so how do we pay attention to validate these feelings, um, to really listen when a person is saying that they are struggling, that they are you know, feeling hopeless and despair. We know that those are really strong signs to pay attention to. Um, we are also seeing that students really want a, an opportunity to connect face to face. And so we might want to create, we being educators, a webinar or something that's recorded, but they really want to see our face, to see us potentially in our own homes and have this kind of vulnerability together to, uh, to share in, in this experience together. So that's something that we're trying to work with um, at the university, um, helping them create a routine, um, helping them also recognize that they can strive for their best, but not perfection. Um, I think perfectionistic thinking outside of a time like this is, is a really hard thing to manage, but then also trying to stay um, kind of up to par and doing all the things perfectly is, is just a, it's a really hard thing to do. And so resisting that pressure helping to again validate that this is difficult and to um, work the best that they can and to reach out but then also have people reach out to them. Um, understanding that self-care and the collective care, I think again I think Dr. Rosenfield talked a little bit um, about the gratitude and how much that that can really help our sense of self and connectedness and so how are we thinking about ourselves outside of individuality but that we're part of a larger um, community and the global um, kind of world right now that is experiencing these fine times. Um, limit news exposure and limiting you know, access to Facebook or Instagram. Again, thinking about all the different parenting guidelines and styles and things that we think we should be taking care of during this time, but really lowering those expectations and doing what really feels good for us in these moments and paying attention to that. And then going to those skill-based offerings. So again, thinking at, at us at the university, what we can be offering for our students virtually that we try to offer to them in their experience um, being on campus, the multitude of um, offices within my division and then and also other divisions across campus that are really trying to support the student's holistic experience at UVM. You know, it's not just their um, academic life, but their whole social and um, spiritual life and, and environment. So how do we um, provide some of those offerings? This was a brief uh, survey that we got off of My Wellbeing. Um, someone shared it with me, and I thought it was just, um, it gave a glimpse, again, of what students are saying that they are needing and wanting. And it looks like that FaceTime and video chat piece is really important. So seeing people's faces, seeing expressions, seeing maybe a tear in someone's eyes or seeing someone feel some emotion um, is, is a really important piece of connectedness during this time. And then um, these are just some resources that we, uh, at the, you'll see on the I guess left or right hand side, whichever way you're looking, some of the UVM resources that we have. So our Center for Health and Wellbeing um, is our um, main area where we provide counseling and psychiatry services, our student health services, um, the office that I'm a part of, which is Living Well Education and Outreach. And then athletic medicine is another um, arm of that, but really trying to make sure that we are providing telehealth to our students through face-to-face um, -face, uh, opportunities, um, having mental health resources available, um, and then doing some of those virtual programming um, opportunities, trying to set up some uh, spaces where students can talk about um, the issues that have been brought up throughout this webinar.
Thank you, Annie. Um, I wanted to also just, uh, I know um, Dr. Rosenfeld, Andy, you need to get going soon. Um, and so I just wanted to give an opportunity. Some of these resources also listed, like the Family Dinner Project and Common Sense Media and Smiling Mind, um, were ones that you shared with us as well. Sure. Do you want to just touch um, on these quickly before I know that you have to um, have to access? Sure. I would just add that um, uh, starting at the top, the NCTSN is the National Center for Trauma and Stress. It's a network of um, People who are experts in this area put together a lot of resources, and this one is that link here is relatively comprehensive. And I know there are some questions on the chat about managing uh, kids who are having difficulty or parents who are having difficulty even before the uh, pandemic crisis and how to address that. So I think that tip sheet is helpful in thinking about that globally. The Family Dinner Project is capturing the idea. In some sense, I think what David's getting at in the chat box of while there is a possibility for some traumatic stress related to this, there's also equally a possibility for traumatic growth. And that for many of us, the most meaningful experiences of our lives are also some of the most difficult. And they turn us around corners and see we're coming. So the Family Dinner Project is an idea for using this forced family time to find some joyful family moments to connect over eating and cooking, shopping to the extent that we can do that, um, and time together, conversation. I think a lot of parents have struggled with screen time. You saw from Annie's data that that's, that's how kids are connecting. So where do we set, you know, all the old limits are kind of out the window. And Common Sense Media has a ton of useful stuff on education, homeschooling, and screen time. I think this link is to a particular article addressing um, the difference between quantity of screen time and quality of screen time, and the science that's pointing toward it matters what you're watching and how you're watching and with whom you're watching, not just how much. Smiling Mind is, um, I think, my favorite mindfulness app because it's free. There's, you, there's not even an option to subscribe, so it's, it comes out of Australia. And it's developmentally sensitive in that there are um, meditations for different age groups as well as different settings. So if you're three years old or you're an adult, you can find something there for you. So you can download that if you're looking to use to find some stillness. Uh, and the other ones I don't think are links that I suggested, but also have a lot of great resources, um, some geared toward specific populations and some applicable to everyone. And Dr. Rosenfeld, before you go, I just wanted to recognize something you did mention um, is the varying age groups in your household and the different challenges that that may present from a mental health and wellness perspective. And I know Dr. Massey was guiding us through the neuroscience and behind what is happening in the brain development of our children. Um, I know you, Dr. F uh, Rosenfeld, have um, varying ages of your children. What's um, some advice that you might give um, for parents that are trying to navigate, um, you know, uh, preschoolers all the way to middle school to undergrad populations? How do you, how can you best approach that as a parent to help them through this? Mm -hmm. That's a big question. I think so. Being developmentally sensitive means paying attention to um, where your child's mind and body are in the same way that you wouldn't. Um, teach a six-month-old to ride a bicycle, you also have to be aware of things like David was mentioning before, the cognitive level of difficulty, the social skills. And at the youngest end of the spectrum for infants and toddlers, you may not need to change too much. They're pretty resilient and adaptable and pretty egocentric in the sense that the natural state of the mind at that age is to kind of see the world as revolving around me. That's, that's how it goes. Um, so they'll notice changes in routine, and they'll benefit from routine, but they don't require a lot of explanation of why you can't go to the playground anymore. They may require still some attention, some fun activities. Um, whereas as kids get older and their minds tend to develop the capacity to think more abstractly and to reason through things, they're going to be overhearing what parents and caregivers are talking about, what's there on the news, and so there's some more caution in monitoring their exposure to those things and even to what older siblings are saying, and also some more space for noticing what their questions are. And school-age kids might get into fears of, 
know, what happens if I get sick, and what can I do concretely to help with this, and what happens if mom and dad get sick, or grandma and grandpa, or um, will I ever see my teachers again? So those would be typical kinds of fears at the uh, sort of monsters under the bed stage of younger kids. As kids get older, more toward like the tween and middle school years, they start to develop more abstract thinking about what this means for the world, about what this means for climate change, about what this means for their future going into high school or going into college. And so there's an opportunity for maybe more anxiety there, but also more problem solving. And it's a really spirited time of life. So that's doubly hard when you're trapped in the house. The kids are finding new ways to connect on, as Annie mentioned, through social media and other fora. Um, and those, that's, that's a time when kids are meant to be out exploring and taking risks. So being confined at a home is hard looking for new ways to help kids uh, explore and take risks to some extent is, I think, a challenge for all of us for the, for the older side of the population. And it just all requires a lot of flexibility. Absolutely. Flexibility and a lot of patience and recognizing as a parent that you can take a break as well. Sometimes um, I have found in my house that um, it's, it, I've been trying to take walks by myself. <laughs> that need that space, sometimes need that time to be able to recharge. As you mentioned at the beginning, we need the oxygen mask for ourselves as well as parents. Yeah, um, hopefully everybody comes out of this with a fuller appreciation of the full-time work that is parenting or that teachers are doing every day and um, that the, now parents aren't getting any time off. It's kind of a 24-7 job. So yeah, finding a way to take a break is uh, only the only route to sanity, I think. Thank you so much for being with us. And I know you do need to go. If you need to um, sign off, um, please do. And we so much appreciate your time today. We are going to wrap up here um, for everybody. I just wanted to recognize, um, Tom, can you just share with us? There's a lot of resources on this slide. Um, and thank you so much, Tom, also for putting those into the chat boxes today, too. But just maybe to give us an overview of what we are seeing here and resources for folks here in Vermont and beyond. Yeah, absolutely. So for people experiencing a mental health crisis, um, calling the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is free, confidential, and they can connect you to services here in Vermont. So that's 800-273-8255, which is 273-TALK. Um, and then the crisis text line is also um, free, confidential. And you know, if you don't want to talk, actually talk to people, texting is a great way to go. And that's just text VT to 741-741. And then a lot of the remaining resources are specific to specific populations, but um, we should probably all all know and be sharing the uh, suicide prevention um, crisis line, lifeline, and we should be sharing the crisis text line as well. Absolutely. And I know there's, um, by different counties and different areas around the state, here are more um, resources for folks in different parts of Vermont. We will also be sharing all of these in follow-up email with a recording of this presentation so to make sure that you have access to those as well. I did also want to share um, that the University of Vermont has many resources, and I know that Annie has listed many of them for our undergrad and graduate students as well. But if there's questions surrounding um, on campus, various different questions, um, the University of Vermont has a lot of information on the Office of Emergency Management. University of Medical, Vermont Medical Center also has a COVID-19 um, page that has a lot of resources. And then if I can, um, hark back to um, Dr. Dan Carney, always her suggestion um, to make sure that you're getting information from the most evidence-based sources in terms of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, uh, the World Health Organization, and the Vermont Department of Health. Um, before we say goodbye and thank you to everybody, I did want to share to folks who are participating today, um, we have an opportunity for you to earn a digital badge, a learn and earn for your participation today. Um, and we have a link here on the screen to claim the badge. And just a quick information, what is that? What do I mean by earning a digital badge for participation? Um, it's a way to demonstrate um, a learning experience that you have gone through today. Um, it is something that people often put on their LinkedIn, um, share socially um, as a credential um, for your own personal and professional development. So we wanted to share that opportunity for you taking the time, the hour, um, out to have this important discussion and learn from our panelists 
um, to actually have a, a, a digital badge and a credential for your time today, um, trying to give um, an opportunity to parents um, to show um, how important and how much we value your time as well. Um, thank you, all of you, and I know um, Andy Rosenfeld had to um, sign off, but thank you so much, Dr. Tomasi, um, Dr. Tom Delaney, and Annie Ann Valentine. Thank you so much for your time, for your resources, and your wisdom, and your patience today. Um, I know everybody has um, found a lot of value in what you presented, and we really appreciate your time. I'm going to sign off with everybody. Um, as we've mentioned, um, we will share this out um, to all folks who have joined us in RSVP. We wish you um, the best in health and, and patience and find those opportunities to find some gratitude in your day. And uh, we wish you well, and we'll hope to see you again soon. Have a great afternoon.